Logic Informal Fallacies, Part 1. Why Study Fallacies? A fallacy is an argument that is defective, either because it is logically invalid or weak, or because it makes an unreasonable assumption. The word fallacy is related to the English word fool and folly, so it means to make a mistake in reasoning. You can divide fallacies into two main kinds. Fallacies of relevance are ones that are logically invalid or weak, which means there's a logical gap between premises and conclusion. The premises fail to give adequate reason to believe the conclusion, even if they're reasonable or even if they're true. In fallacies of presumption, the premises include an unreasonable assumption. Even if the premise is true, it's not reasonable to assume the audience or target of the argument would accept it unless they already believe the conclusion. So fallacies of presumption assume too much in the premises. Fallacies of relevance fail to justify the conclusion based on the premises. We can also divide fallacies into formal and informal. In formal fallacies, there's an error in the logical form or structure of an argument. So regarding the argument as a fallacy is based on its general form, regardless of the particular contents or statements that are made. An example of a formal fallacy we learned in the chapter on intro to logic, specifically where we went over valid and invalid arguments, is affirming the consequent. All arguments that share this same structure or pattern of premises and conclusion are logically invalid. So here's a particular example of affirming the consequent. If you're taking this logic course, then you're a human. Kanye West is human. Therefore, Kanye West is taking this logic course. It clearly illustrates why the argument form is a fallacy, because the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. Informal fallacies are ones that have a logical error that's defined, at least in part, based on the meaning that's expressed in the propositions or statements of the argument. So informal fallacies are not defined purely in terms of their logical form. An example is the post hoc fallacy. Post hoc arguments assume that because one event or factor came before another event or factor, the first must have caused the second. So here's a particular illustration of that. Ever since the bear patrol started, there have been no bear sightings in Springfield. Therefore, the bear patrol has kept the bears away. This ignores other possible explanations. Maybe there were never any bears in the first place, or maybe the bears went away for some other reason. So it's worth asking the question, why should we study fallacies in the first place? What do we hope to gain? In fact, some logic professors argue that you should not study fallacies. They don't teach fallacies in their classes. Oftentimes, they're quite proud to announce that fact. Why? Well, because sometimes you can misuse your knowledge of fallacies and see fallacies where they don't exist. We'll talk about that in a minute. But actually, there are some advantages, some good reasons to study fallacies. And I've observed oftentimes the same professors who say you shouldn't teach fallacies they will use names of fallacies to critique arguments that they don't like. So it shows you that studying fallacies can be quite useful. The first reason to study fallacies is that it helps you become aware of how pervasive bad reasoning is. And this is bad reasoning given to us by others, such as politicians, the media, entertainment, journalism, etc., but also by ourselves. We deceive ourselves by having unreasonable or irrational arguments. We oftentimes want to believe something, so we'll cling and clutch at any reason we can think of that helps justify it, for example. This is motivated reasoning. So when we study the fallacies, we at least have some defense against bad reasoning. We at least have the ability to recognize when this is happening, so we won't be repeatedly duped by the same sorts of errors. And related to this um, is the fact that when we study named fallacies, we learn a skill of pattern recognition. So it's not just being aware of bad arguments in general. We can spot particular types of bad arguments when they appear based on a cluster of properties. 
So this is similar to the way in which a physician learns to diagnose diseases based on a cluster of symptoms. Nevertheless, it is indeed possible to misuse your knowledge of fallacies. So I'll talk about a couple of ways in which that can happen. One way can be called the arguing from fallacy, which is presuming a claim is false because it is justified by a fallacy. I'm actually getting this term from the cartoon meme on the right. It's not one that I saw before in the logic textbook. I'm sure it's out there now. But the point is this can happen. So keep in mind, if an argument is a fallacy, this does not necessarily mean the conclusion is false. What does it actually mean then? It means the argument fails to justify the conclusion. Failure to justify the conclusion means we don't know whether the conclusion is true or false based on that argument. It does not prove the conclusion is false. There could be another non-fallacious argument out there that does prove the conclusion. So it is indeed a mistake to conclude that a claim must be false just because a fallacy is what's being used to justify it. So be careful in how you deploy fallacies. Realize that when you defeat an argument by successfully labeling it a fallacy, you don't thereby necessarily prove the conclusion false. Another mistake that can be made with fallacies is what I call the fallacy fallacy. This is incorrectly asserting that an argument is a fallacy, what in fact it is not. So how can this happen? Well, one of the reasons is that um, some good arguments can share the same general form or structure as fallacies or bad arguments. The cartoon on the right, even though it's illustrating the concept of the arguing from fallacy, it actually does a better job of illustrating the fallacy fallacy. So let's look at the two panels of the cartoon or comic. In the first panel, we see two um, lab mates or people who work at a lab chatting. The first says, hey, I read in this paper that you shouldn't handle flesh eating bacteria like that. And the second lab worker says, oh, so you just believe whatever you read? This second lab worker is evidently referencing the argument from unqualified authority fallacy. The argument from unqualified authority, as our textbook calls it, is also sometimes just called the argument from authority fallacy. And this, this fallacy um, is a mistake because it's reasoning just because an alleged authority figure says something, therefore it must be true. Now, this is an invalid argument because just because a person says something, even if they are an authority, it doesn't logically guarantee what they're saying is true. They could have bad information. They could be lying. There's possibilities. So the problem with this second lab mate is that they're failing to recognize when sometimes you actually do have reason to believe something based on the fact that some authority said it. So if there is a scientific paper published in a peer reviewed journal that says something, that does not guarantee the truth of what that says. That's true. However, it does give you some reason to believe it. It makes that claim more probable. So arguments from authority can be logically strong if they're handled properly. This would actually be an argument from a qualified or an appropriate authority. And the fallacy is usually best reserved for cases where the authority is not qualified or the authority's qualifications are unknown. So we can see on the second panel of the comic, the second lab mate died because he didn't believe the appropriate authority. So this is an example of the fallacy fallacy because sometimes an argument like can seem like it's an appeal to authority, but it's actually not a fallacy. It's doing it in a careful and rational way. Related to this point, we should keep in mind that arguments can exhibit degrees of fallaciousness, degrees of being a fallacy. This is true for arguments that are fallacies because they're logically weak. Logical weakness and logical strength exist on a spectrum, on a continuum. So an argument can be defined as logically weak if the premises do not prove the conclusion is more than 50% probable. However, if you think about it, if you add in additional information, the same general argument form 
can increase in strength. For example, if we give additional reasons for believing that a given source is indeed an appropriate or qualified authority, we strengthen the argument. And once we get past a certain threshold, we can call the argument logically strong and no longer a fallacy. Another example of this is the fallacy of hasty generalization. This fallacy argues that a generalization must be true based on too few examples. However, the more examples that you add to the argument, the more it can be strengthened, as long as you don't have any reason to believe or to suspect that those additional examples are gonna be biased in some way, i.e. not representative of the general group that you're theorizing about. So hasty generalization fallacy can be turned into a strong argument by adding more or better examples. Next up, part two, personal attacks and emotional appeal fallacies.